Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret Ma. And I'm Paige Wallace. And today we're talking about intro to English studies, those courses that I think with more frequency are popping up in English departments. Margaret has had the pleasure of teaching one of these courses in the recent past. Margaret, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so as I kind of just said, I think... From my perspective, this seems to be a recent phenomena. Um, And so when I was teaching it, it was only in its like second or third semester of being a course offered at FSU. Um, And they were still figuring out what exactly they wanted the course to be. So in some ways, there was a lot of room to play. Um, There wasn't any... A lot of concrete things. There were things we had to do or assignments we had to include. So I was told I had to have an objective midterm, like one that had multiple choice answers. It could have short essays and things like that, but it also had to have multiple choice or matching, etc. I was told that I had to cover poetry, prose, and drama. I had to cover theorists and literary terms. And I had to teach a novel when I covered prose. But other than that, it was all kind of up to me how I wanted to order it, um, what sort of themes or topics I covered, what novel I picked, etc. So it was nice in that I got to really think about how do I want to, how do I want to teach the skills that I think every English major should have, um, what sort of ideas that I think every English major need to consider. And I also had the added parameter of I was teaching it in a summer semester. So had to do it all in six weeks. Yeah, that's like (laughs) a pretty hefty plate for a 16 week semester. Yeah. It was also the second summer term. So, you know, uh, 4th of July falls right in it. And I think that year 4th of July fell on a Wednesday. (laughs) So I knew that um, we weren't going to have class on that Wednesday. And students were not going to be showing up the rest of the week, that they were going home, they were going for barbecues, and they were not coming back. So, they were like five and a half weeks. <laughs> um, but they were a good class. I do. I want to say that up front. And it was a nice, they were a really good class to do kind of a pilot mm-hmm. test on. Um, because it was, they were all English majors, because it was the newly required course for English majors, but they all had a vast range of goals for it that some were doing more of the um ewm track within the english department so ewm is for those who are unfamiliar editing writing and media and um there were some who were creative writers there were some who were kind of strict english majors they were there for the um literature emphasis and then others were there because they wanted to be teachers so thinking through all those goals of like, these are the things that you can do with an English major. So like having to push beyond that false idea that all English majors want to go to grad school. Yeah. And so I have a question about the English majors. Uh, Were they in like their first major classes or had they all, what did it seem like to you? Had they all already started taking some of those like major intensive classes? Again, it was a range. Okay. Um, so I had some who had just finished their freshman year and were getting a head start on on their kind of major courses over the summer. Some were rising seniors <laughs> who were not grandfathered okay. in <laughs> and trying to knock it out. Um, and then, you know, the rest obviously in the middle. Um, and I'm now remembering, I actually subbed for one of our friend's courses when she was teaching it, and that was the first semester they had it. And... In her class, it was typically juniors and seniors. There may have been a few freshmen and sophomores thrown in there, but it was majority juniors and seniors. So I don't know if her experience was the standard one or if it's because that was the first semester that you had students who were having under a deadline. Yeah, because it seems, I wonder about it being a prereq for some of the the higher level literature classes, especially if it's more of a skill-based um, how do we do literature, right? Mm. Or how do we, like, what's the work that happens in these classrooms? And if this is, this intro to English studies is a part of developing that 
set of skills. I think it definitely should be a prereq. If it isn't, I'm not too sure what the situation is. But the emphasis was on those foundational skills rather than, you know, transitioning your your English studies to be on the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very focused on this is what you'll be accomplishing in the English classroom, English literature classroom. So this is how you, you need to write. This is how you need to read, etc. cetera. Um, so I know when I subbed for that class, there were sentiments shared just in that I, I subbed twice that they felt yeah we know Mm -hmm. this yeah um we've been writing these essays we've been reading these books versus when I taught it most of them were you know freshman sophomore going into junior year um where they didn't have that sense of yeah I know yeah 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 so I think it's also useful to get it in the beginning so you don't have to do this unlearning of okay yes you've been writing these papers but you haven't been writing them in the best Mm -hmm. methods or the most effective ways and having to show them that um, because then you have a defensive student, which is just less productive. You have to spend more time getting them to trust you. Right, right. Yeah, and so, because I guess I'm thinking about my own experience, which is very different. I have not taught this class, but I did take this class, like a version of this in undergrad, not at FSU, but I took it very early on in the major and it was mm. one of like the most useful important classes that I that I took in the English major just because it did give me that those foundations right beyond it was just the composition classroom uh, which is more of a general approach to writing and a, a lot of times you have English majors or intended English English majors that uh, test out of those classes yeah. and so this I, I didn't, forgot about the test. Yeah, and so this is like a time, you know, that intro to English studies for me specifically was a way to um, be really grounded in having the tools necessary to mm-hmm. do close reading and to write um, solid essays. And we also did a lot of work in that class with using uh, databases and research and and doing that from a specifically sort of like uh, within the English major track what kind of tools will will you need from the library and so I found Mm. that to be really helpful but I I I think you're right in that assumption that it maybe isn't as helpful when those students have already been taking the kind of upper level 3000 level um literature classes and they feel like they are they already have mastered the basics of literary analysis and literary like literary research essays yeah, and so it's it's nice because exactly what you're saying too, like you get those really specific skills of how does like literary scholarship work, um, how do you contextualize your essays, um, also like what you were kind of pointing to, like how do you cite for most English classes, like it is different than how you would cite in a bio class, um, and it's not just, like, the formatting, but it's, like, the rationale and reasons. Like, I think a lot of times students don't understand that, like, when you're citing in an English class, you're in part citing to show what conversations you're entering, mm-hmm. not to show that you are absolutely correct and you have come to the correct analysis that everyone else has come to as well. Right. Like, so working through all of those sorts of things and then even just... One of the big things I like to emphasize is like reading with the grain or reading against the grain. So like talking about the types of reading that we do and having a space for that, I think is really, really. Margaret, when we're thinking about how there are these really these different focuses um, or pathways for creating an intro to English studies course, I'm interested in hearing more about like your specific goals for that class. My personal goals going in to it was could they critically engage with a text? And by that, I mean, like, twofold. That one, could they create an original analysis where they were really understanding the text and could point to individual parts, so that close reading, but also being able to contextualize that within a larger conversation, so research, etc. When they read, could they keep in mind like a theorist and be like oh this is maybe a a gender studies moment (laughs) a feminist theory moment 
or a Marxist theory, a race theory. My other primary goal was teach them the skills necessary to write an effective literary analysis or a research paper. There's writing skills. So reading skills, writing skills. The personal goal that I had was giving them the cultural capital to be able to put texts in that cultural web. So understanding that nothing exists in a vacuum, culture responds to culture. So I talk a lot with my students about just like it takes money to make money, it takes culture to make culture or to understand culture. Um, so my class was shaped around reading and rereading the Odyssey, the different iterations of it. So we looked at not only different translations of it, but then like uh, poems inspired by it, plays inspired by it, novels, etc. And try to take a global perspective with it because the Odyssey has become such a benchmark in Western literary canons that, and then, you know, colonialism spreads yeah. it. <laughs> so you get these responses around the world so you can kind of see how culture shifts, evolves, adapts, um, challenges, and use that kind of capital to as a grounding for those conversations. Yeah, and that sounds really interesting. And I, it, I like that what you're doing is sort of holding on to or using, pivoting from a central sort of story or mythology that's very recognizable for most of them when they come in. Um, and so that idea, it seems like that idea of reading with the grain or against the grain is was probably a huge part of like those pivots uh, to the different iterations of the Odyssey. Yeah, and like with reading with and against the grain, it was actually really nice that we did so many different versions of it because like we looked at multiple translations of it, um, like uh, Alexander Pope's to Emily Wilson's recent, which Emily Wilson, I believe, is the first woman to ever translate the Odyssey into English, which would happen in like 2016, which is like, wait, how? <laughs> so don't quote me on that because I'm not sure it's correct, but I, that's what I remember. But anyways, because they were seeing all these different versions, they would see the different ways the same story could be presented. So like in some scenes, the violence seemed to be glorified and others, it seemed to be positioned as less than ideal. And so then they could like really think about how am I meant to read this scene? Like, is Odysseus a hero in this scene? Like, I know technically he's the hero, but does the translator think he right. is? Um, and that was even before we got to the poems and, and other adaptations. So that was really fun to Yeah, do. and I haven't even thought about uh, bringing in something like the sort of ethics with translation. Um, but that's really mm -hmm. interesting and also seems like it could lend to some critical conversations about whose voice is heard, which one is bolstered in um, this discipline, and mm -hmm. what does that mean for the canon and how we read these texts? And there's a lot of conversation about translations of the Odyssey, where you can use it to have those really necessary conversations about translation and interpretation. Like, so we talked about, like, that translation is interpretation, because... There's not a one-for-one one in language or meter and all of that. And so the decision to, you know, do it in hexameter mm -hmm. versus <laughs> prose versus whatever. Like, these are intentional decisions that affect the way the text is interpreted. Um, another good one to do that with, though, is uh, Seamus Heaney's Beowulf. Yeah. Right, is, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, well, so I wanted to ask a follow-up, and not to put you on the spot in case you can't um, recall, but... With that conversation, can you think of any secondary texts that you had them look at for this idea of translation? Um, we didn't really use secondary texts in terms of theory because there wasn't enough time. Right, which makes sense. Um, Why didn't you do more yeah. during that six weeks, Margaret? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am um, trying to think what framework there was um so with the translations it, we also did sort of like almost a multimodal approach so we looked at a reading of the original greek that had been 
like it's supposed to be a construction of the ancient Greek, but we also watched like a video that I think the BBC did okay. where they're doing it in the Greek. Um, and we talked about the ways like it was almost a, a little bit comfy in that we were talking about like what are they doing rhetorically to make us see certain things. And like I, I remember in class we even like had talks about this is like a national text versus or an international text. Like, so when does this become kind of a moment? Like when we do it in the ancient Greek or we do it in Greek, how does that then like become a point of like a specific cultural pride moment um, and cultural heritage versus like a shared mm-hmm. text? Like when we're adapting into the English and, and it feels like a communal mm-hmm. work. Um, we also talked, I'm trying to think other things with specific translations. Um, I, so I guess this is the other uh, aside that because we had to cover literary terms, that's primarily what was guiding our conversation about these translations. Like we were talking about how these different literary terms, the authors were using techniques rather were affecting our interpretation and how these literary techniques reflected their time. Um, in place, so, like, Alexander Pope, when we looked at his translation, we talked about how it was much more accessible than earlier versions, so how he's bringing it to the masses, and that's, like, a specific moment in culture, like, oh, like, culture can be accessible, it doesn't have to be, um, kept away, or, like, the first translation into prose like why what's the motive Mm -hmm. for that so we we've talked a lot about the motives behind literary techniques that a symbol is not just chosen at random like they all that's the other thing that's interesting you're it's an intro course you still do have students who kind of think oh they say that the curtains are blue and that's virginal just but it's so arbitrary that's just something high school teachers say like to really think about well, why would blue represent virginity? Like, what are the cultural connotations? Like, so let's talk about the Virgin Mary and, and et cetera. Um, so it helped to break them of that, that, oh, literary interpretation is arbitrary. It's all made up. You can just bullshit your way through it. And they just have to agree with you because there's no wrong answers. Mm-hmm. We're <laughs> and thinking, no, there's wrong answers. There's no one right answer. But there's still a lot of wrong answers. <laughs> um... That is and the hill you're going to die on, right, Margaret? <laughs> it is. There there are a lot of objectively wrong answers out there. <laughs> um, so many are coming to mind right now. But anyways, <laughs> and part of the ways you can know that something is potentially right is basing it in the, that literary technique, its motivations, its cultural context, how you're reading it. And so... Now you're making me wish that I could point to a specific uh, secondary text on translations that I used, but we didn't um, just because... Yeah, and I, right, not enough time, but I, I think that's something that if you had had the full 16 weeks would probably... I think because I am also mm-hmm. blanking and not able to give you anything definite, but I know that there's some secondary texts that talk about like that, that there is not that one-to-one um, translation. Yeah. Um, and I think you could even do a lot of really great post-colonial reading. Absolutely. With it, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there, and that's something I would definitely want to incorporate in the future now that we're talking well, about Well, also, that. what I was thinking about while you were talking was, like, some of the book, hi- the history of the book classes mm-hmm. and how not to make intro to English studies that, right, because that's already a class, but it seems that... When you're thinking about like cultural capital and how ideas move um, and that sort of f- flow uh, from a text that belongs to a sp- specific place and time to a sort of communal text, it might also be interesting to pull in some of the the that grounded history of book publishing. Yeah. Sorry, no, you're fine. You I'm just excited about this. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's also tied to translation, right? And mm-hmm. what, where it in, you know, like you said, it's only recently that a woman has translated that text. But uh, you know, what regions or areas have translations of that particular text? And yeah, yeah, I'm not. That's not fully formed as an idea, but it's definitely something I think 
to think about. Yeah, no, no. Cause it, it's nice because you can see, like, it, if you look around the world, like, the adaptations, what they choose to focus on from the text, it doesn't tell you anything about ancient Greek culture. It tells you about the culture in which it's adapted. Um, so I think that helps students to see how culture is both shared but also distinct. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing that came to mind when you were talking is something I went over with my students is almost like we could use all of these adaptations of the Odyssey to think about the history of reading and interpretation and theory, which was one of the goals of the class um, for me. So thinking about like that originally the Odyssey is an oral text. And so how does that function? versus a written text. So we talked about like going from that web-based thinking where, you know, in the Odyssey you get that, I'm gonna tell you a story, but before I tell you that story, I have to tell you this story, which also is connected to this other story I'm assuming you're familiar with. And you just keep going where everything's, you can kind of do these offshoots. It's a little bit choose your own adventure. So some adaptations later, like you don't necessarily get the background for one character, but others you might get more versus a written text. We get into linear styles of thinking of, you point A leads to point B, which leads to point C, which leads to point D, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Um, and that everything is very clearly connected. So we talked about how engaging with these texts affects the way our, our brain's going to approach these topics and, and think about the way ideas work. And that now with the internet, we're coming back to that web-based thinking. Um, web. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, but, well, um, I think yeah. what you're getting at, I just read this earlier, like this paragraph that was talking about how learning is messy. Mm -hmm. And I really like that idea. And I think it's connected to this idea that like, you don't move from point A to B to C to D, right? Um, it's, yeah. it's a much more fluid, messier process. Yeah, like you're juggling multiple tabs at the same time for using the internet as the example, like Wikipedia, like you go through these links of, oh, I don't understand what they're talking about, but this blue link will give me that background. But if you already know it, you can keep going. Yeah. Um, and it's not that everyone has to be on the exact same page at the exact same time or follow that same path um, to understand these topics. So thinking about how we access these texts as English majors and how that's going to shape the way we interpret and analyze um, and think about ideas. So that was a really fun thing to do with my students. We only did it like one day. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of drawing on the whiteboard. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but um, we do kind of keep going back to those ideas throughout when we talk about literary techniques that thinking about a lot of those poetic techniques with sound like assonance and um, they work better almost when it is an oral text, it, you might miss it when it's written. So those sorts of effects versus, I don't know, I'll leave it there. But there's there's a lot that you can branch off with that. I'm doing web-based thinking right now, and right now my mind is exploding into <laughs> a mind map. <laughs> but what about you? For the class you took, what did you think the goal of it was for you as a well, student? Well, so I am going to just like plagiarized straight from um dr seaman uh from college of charleston uh who's the professor that i took that class with her website where she uses this phrase disciplinary identity and so Love background that. is that i was originally just a biology major and i started taking some english classes and picked up that english as my second major late into like freshman year but a lot of it had to do with that particular class that I, it was a prereq for some of the lit classes that I wanted to take. And so I was like, oh, I'll take it. And it ended up sort of giving me a really positive like overview of the kind of critical thinking skills and this sort of new world that had always seemed really disconnected for me from what I was doing in biology in that major and so this class was like felt like a way to make connections between all the things that I really enjoyed and cared about and a lot of that happened via theory so it was very much we did not have like a we focused on literary terms theory and then we read The Wife of Bath's Tale from Chaucer but there wasn't like in your class I know you had to do like drama poetry in a novel but so I think maybe 
I, it's been a long time, but I think it was a little more heavy on theory. And I think what I would be excited about trying to recreate is that when you say a class is about theory, it often feels like very definitional and boring and not connected to what you're doing in the world, right? And yeah. That class did such a good job. Again, we use like the literary theory toolbox, which were really basic definitions, but it did such a good job of like you're talking about with the with uh the Odyssey of taking a text that like the wife of Bath and using it to make us think about all these real world implications so that that theory is not just the definition, but it it's something that is born out of a cultural context that's important mm-hmm. and and impacts how we see the world and how we shape the world and so it ended up being I think that's why I'm, I'm always excited about this class like I was really excited when FSU put this class on the docket for us to sign up for unfortunately I immediately got a new job not not unfortunately <laughs> fortunately but the downside is that I didn't get to teach this class and it it is one that I feel like had a huge impact on me as an undergrad and and so I, I'm kind of a champion for it. I think it's a class that students should take early on in the major. There's also, it was also this sort of technical side of it in which when I took it, we did these like mini assignments where you had to write, here's what the intro to a literary research essay would be and with a strong thesis statement. Now write the par- a paragraph that you'd find somewhere in the middle of the essay and include strong transitions. And, you know, sort of like that very like on a, like a micro scale of writing. Yeah. It's almost like reverse engineering. Yeah. Some, like a recipe of like, okay, you you've seen the final product. You've seen these beautiful chocolate cakes. But how are you gonna right? Make exactly. That? That's that's a great metaphor. Um, and that's also a class that I don't want to like go on too long. But that's also a class that has, and maybe not even just a class, but the professor that impacted like the way I think English studies should should be it was a very like Mm -hmm. discussion-led class we had two conferences over the course of the semester and we've talked about this before sometimes in literature classes you know we don't conference you just something they're more students or it doesn't feel as um relevant as it does in a composition class but it was it was a really important part of that for me well i think we tend to not have conferences in literature classes when all of the writing is shoehorned into the very end of the semester. And we're talking right now about a class where that writing is built yes. into it. That part of the class's goal is to teach a student how to write a literary analysis or a literary research paper. So I, de- I guess you don't have to have writing built into that throughout the semester, but I think you right. should. Right, <laughs> like there's a balance between like what our job is in terms of teaching writing right? And mm-hmm. teaching writing differently than we do in a composition class and teaching literature. And sometimes that balance, I think, gets thrown off where students are in a class. And, and I feel like I'm guilty of this. And you're, we're so excited. We're so focused on the literature part of it that some of what the instruction on the writing side is not dealt with as it should be because we assume that our student has it already. They know how to do this. Yeah. They've, they've done that comp class and they're, they're ready. They're ready to write these literary research papers. And most of the time they're not. And I think one of the benefits for this sort of course for professors and instructors is that it forces us to confront a lot of assumptions we have about students, like exactly what you're saying. We assume that they have this cultural capital. We assume that they have these skills. We assume that they've already done this. And that's problematic for like a variety of reasons and that's something like a trap I've fallen into before and we really have to do a better job of checking ourselves Mm -hmm. of that because it does keep students from pursuing these sorts of studies because it's already this idea of like I had my theory professor in undergrad said this and I think about it all the time I'm not going to say that I 100% stand by it but I think it's worth considering of that to choose to study literature requires you have a certain amount of privilege already that you're not trying to learn like how to be an engineer so you can build your own house to protect yourself from the elements like you study literature like when you have resources and I think that's something we need to change (laughs) like that 
it shouldn't just be for students who are privileged enough to not worry. Like, it. Li- this sounds so silly, but yeah, literature majors are for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and, but it's professors who keep it from not being Right, and so there's a sense that if we talk about the practicality, right? And so mm-hmm. I'd like to just, like, vocally be an antithesis to that, right? Um, and so yeah. I'm a first-gen college student, but some of the anxiety about my English major is why I also majored in biology because there's this sense of, well, Mm -hmm. if I can't do anything with that, then I've got this real thing to fall back on. And that's just generally unfair, I think. And so we did talk briefly about how in an intro to English studies class, you could also include an assignment that asks students to build a resume for like a job that they're interested in that they could pursue with this particular major. And I don't know... I might make that something like an extra credit, just assignment. It could be a really good reflection. Absolutely. That's a good point. It could be a really good reflection activity. But also, you don't want to become, you know those posters that are like, what can you do with an English major? Who are famous people that have an English major? I don't know if anyone listening has seen those or have those in their department, but... I don't want to become the personified version of that, but I do think there's something in appreciating and recognizing that there are career paths like for English majors and that it is not just Mm -hmm. a lackadaisical... It's not a resting on your laurels, I'm just here because what else am I going to do major? It's not like... Which I think there is that assumption I think when we think about you know privilege in in college settings English majors are often at the forefront of that but it's not I think being able to critically think analyze and effectively communicate is useful in any path one takes well and Um, not to cut you off but our students I think our students don't think that right those ones that are in the class and they're they're English majors but they need to defend themselves against their parents and their friends that are like what are you going to do with this degree which is a lovely question that um I still get so thinking about is this class also giving them some of the skills where they can think about why does this matter outside of what we're doing in here? Um, how can it translate to, to my real world life? Yeah, so with that, when we're teaching those skills, we've talked about this a little bit already, but just to make it more explicit, like how would you teach close reading skills or writing skills in an intro class where you can't assume your students have any background with this? So you're either trying to get some students caught up or students that have already, you know, done AP English and feel like they have a handle on it. How do you get them all on the same page in this sort of class? Like I'm putting you a little bit on the spot. So if you aren't. No. So I think that the first thing that I try, A, I haven't taught this class. So for full transparency, Mm -hmm. but the first thing I try to do in any class um, or like an intro to, to, to literature class is to talk to them about their resources I think that that's something that they should have in their toolbox that I know what my resources are, where to find them, and when I need to access them. And so it's not a composition class, so I'm not going to plan any lessons where I'm teaching you how paragraph structures work. But your resources are the writing center or my office hours when I'm happy to do that with you. And I think that that, this is not answering your question about close reading, But I think that that then prepares them for when we talk about things like um, using the library to find source materials so that uh, some of what happens can be self-taught so that if they don't know how to do something, they know that they can depend on themselves, right? They have that intrinsic sense of self-efficacy, that I can figure this out. And I think that that's important to instill in them so that they can figure out where their holes are and patch them up or work on patching them up. But obviously there's things that I have to do. Part of that is I almost always have students write proposals for papers so that we can discuss them beforehand. With close reading, I don't know. I think maybe I'm guilty of assuming that students 
are prepared to close read when they get into when they come into a literature class. So I'd like to hear about what you do with your students in terms of close reading. I've talked about it. Uh, I think in a previous episode we did of the digital annotations. Uh, yes. Where my students, and so it was in this class that I first did this, where they had to take a passage from the Odyssey, I think uh, from the Emily Wilson translation, and they had to create on their Wix site a digital annotation. So they thought about like how they wanted the hyperlink or footnote. And exactly what you said of resources, I provided examples. So of other sorts of digital annotation. So we looked at um, Columbia University's um, digital annotation of Ulysses mm-hmm. and talked about that sort of connection briefly. I forget now the other ones we looked at. That's the one that immediately comes to mind. But we looked at all the different ways they format it and talked about like, well, what sort of audience is this sort of annotation for? What sort of audience is this one for? Why? And then we talked about how they're going to have to think about their audience for creating these annotations. Is it for other English majors? Is it for people who have never heard of the Odyssey? Is it for high schoolers? Is it for people interested in ancient Greek culture? (laughs) And that that would drive it. And then they had to identify two techniques and two kind of content bits that they were going to assess. But to build up to that, we did a lot of in-class assignments. And I think for an intro to English studies class, in-class assignments are a great time to build those skills because in the beginning of the semester, you might not know like who's the stronger students, who are the students that need more help, but you can still go around the room and check in and, and see what's going on and ask them to talk about it. So it gives you that one-on-one time for them to ask questions. Maybe they're not comfortable asking in front of the class, but for close reading um we had i should say fsu also required that we use textbooks and i hate for myself when i'm required to use a textbook and then the students are required to buy it and then we don't use it Uh, because i just feel like that's asking students to throw away money so if i have to require a textbook i require myself to incorporate it So the textbook had guiding questions to have them think about like what techniques are being used, what effect do they have, but they were also even more basic. Like how did this passage make you feel? Why did it make you feel this way? And so thinking more broadly, if you're not using a textbook, you can think about how students' initial tendency to react by either saying, I like this, I didn't like this, is actually a really useful way to start. So why didn't you like it? And then you can move on to, is it effective or ineffective? And what is the writer doing that makes it effective or ineffective? So we would do that in class where I would give them a passage, break them up into pairs, and they'd individually respond to these guiding questions and then talk with their partner about how they answered it and then build it off of, build off of that to say like, these are the three techniques the writer's using that I think are most effective, and here's why. And then we would go on to moving from that close reading to interpretation. So thinking again, like initial reactions. What does the author use to start bringing in the reader? What are questions that this passage prompts you to ask or or is directly asking? And we also talked about like taking notes. Like I would show them my marginal notes, like what I'm making notes of sometimes it's just simple as like writing down haha like oh this is funny and then I talk to them about how I could go through a novel and look at every moment I write haha and maybe do an analysis on humor in <laughs> like Shakespeare that's not a novel but you get the right. point and so like talking about how when we close read one of the things we're also looking for are patterns what what keeps happening like that those ha-has or the color blue coming up again and again, or a certain character doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, so that that's one way to do close reading. A lot of it is just that practice in class and talking about reading against the grain. Do we take the text at, at its word or do we challenge it? Sometimes it's like showing a passage and then talking about like, well, what isn't in this passage? What is it ignoring? Right. 
and like thinking about that. Well, and I think I, my other question is that I'm assuming that other people had different themes, uh, like other instructors had mm-hmm. different themes. That and that your theme to look at the Odyssey in these multiple different adaptations, translations, so on and so forth, is a really unique approach to the class. I think. Uh, like, do you have, like, how did you come up with that theme, A? And do you have any advice for how other people might sort of figure out an, as interesting a theme or approach to an intro to English studies? So, the reason I picked the Odyssey was I was responding to the workload, honestly. That I forget what I had originally anticipated doing. But it was not the Odyssey. <laughs> but once I found out that we had to do prose, poetry, and and drama all together, I was like, I need something to anchor this course for the students so they have something to hold on to as we keep applying. That they need that foundation that's holding the course together so it doesn't feel like we're starting over every class of, and now we're learning right. this, and now we're learning right. this. Because that, that's how they get burned out. I wanted one clear theme that was going to unite everything together and I wanted it to be a specific text so they felt like it was an in-depth study of something rather than just an assortment of skills and I went with the Odyssey because it's a text I assumed most of them were familiar with less of them were familiar with it than I had anticipated but it was still about half the class Um, I did start the class where I had scanned a picture book I have of the Odyssey to make sure everyone is familiar with the story overall and then we got into it. But the Odyssey for me was as close to as a global text as we get. That's so early on. You can avoid that pitfall of it being like the white male experience or the white female experience standing in for all of English studies. I wanted it to be something that while it was grounded allowed for diverse perspectives. I think you could do something like that if you chose like one Shakespeare text and then look at all the different adaptations like taking, you know, Romeo and Juliet or Macbeth or Othello and like looking at all the different adaptations of it throughout the years. You wouldn't want to just do all of Shakespeare because then it's yeah. just Shakespeare's perspective. Right. And so that's what I would say to, I guess, people trying to pick a theme is what will allow you to best balance and accomplish all the goals you have to accomplish in this course, but also what will allow for the range of perspectives that should exist in the English mm-hmm. major and, and break free from maybe the the patterns that have been established in the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that with that, we might, we maybe should start wrapping up. The one side note, I, I can't remember if I said this, but if you do have to balance a ton of different genres in your intro to English studies, it's okay to kind of find some shortcuts or loopholes to better help cover the materials. So things like in my class, we watched Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? To, and we looked at the script. The script for Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? is online. So that was our drama portion of it. Because in just six weeks, we did not have time for me to teach them how to read a play the way I think they're meant to be read and talk about, you know, performance and all of that, that we could watch the movie and it was just easier for them to access that in a way that it wasn't going to be on the page that you, it's hard to imagine a performance when you're reading it. So that allowed us to also think about what I was saying before about types of reading that to, to watch a play is you're watching someone's interpretation mm-hmm. and same with a film. So, you know, things like that find those shortcuts and embrace yeah, them. Yeah, that's really good <laughs> advice, I think. And it, it also helps to not overload them like you were you were mentioning. Yeah, they love watching movies and they're going to pay attention because they don't want to lose the opportunity to watch movies again. <laughs> so they will invest. They'll take notes. They'll do everything you ask them right. to do. So it's not a cop-out teaching-wise, I think. So I guess we'll wrap up. What is your dream course for this week, Paige? That's, mm, I don't know. I think what... Do you want me to go and you, you think of it? No, oh. I I guess now I really just want to teach this class. <laughs> and I, and I know goal. that's like a cop-out a little. But I, re- I have been interested 
in it, this class um, for a while, and I loved your approach to it. Oh. And I don't know what my approach would be, but I definitely think I would want to do something in the same way, like some central text and then adaptations of it. And so I might bring in adaptation study or in terms of theory as part of that the, the conversations as well. But yeah, so tell me your dream course. I just want to move on from me and yeah. yeah. My dream course for this week is thinking about unmarried women of modernism. Okay. Last summer, I started thinking about how few novels we have that feature a female protagonist who is unhappily married and stays unhappily married. Okay. Like, that the conflict is never resolved by her getting married or she's not finally fulfilled through marriage. That She's just like, I'm fine on my own. Conflict mm-hmm. elsewhere. <laughs> so, in modernism, we start to see some of these figures... And maybe only in modernism for the most part. So one of the novels that I am obsessed with and have never taught, and I think this would be the perfect class, is Lolly Willis. Okay. Where it's this modernist novel that starts as a comedy of manners. Lolly Willis is like the spinster aunt in like post-war year in England. Um, her family kind of feels like she can't take care of herself, so they have to take care of her. And then one day she realizes that she has an inheritance that her brother has been, like, managing for her and not giving the full extent. And she takes that money, buys a house in, like, rural England, and then all of a sudden the novel changes into witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> the town is like a coven of witches. And so it's really cool. I really like it. It's it's really fascinating. But, like... She's always fine with being unmarried. Like, her family tries to set her up, and she's like, I don't get this. And then you have other novels, like The Last September. There's some unmarried women. It's a lot on girlhood, but women who kind of stay unmarried as well. Nightwood, Mm -hmm. thinking about some of those women. Like, queerness and and marital status. I think that would be something we're talking about. Or, like, The Ambassadors. Mariah Goshry kind of maybe wants to get married, but doesn't quite say it. And I've just been trying to think of other texts that have unmarried yeah. women. And thinking about what that helps us understand about characterization and cultural shifts and all of that fun stuff. And not to get us back on the Gilmore Girls, but yeah. you could look, you, like, Laura, not seriously, but Lorelai is the, the ultimate, like, pining figure that definitely wants to be married. But I also don't think she actually wants to. I think Lorelai feels like she's disappointing everyone by not being married. And Lorelai likes being part of a community. But Lorelai is not actually happy when she gets married in a committed relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So. Like, yeah, so I think Lorelai is a figure that should be unmarried, (laughs) but is not. And that's... We might even think about... Sorry, now that I'm thinking about... Lorelai, I think, gets married because fans want her to be married. Mm -hmm. That goes back to Little Women, that Joe gets married because you have to have a marriage to resolve a female plot. So, and that's why I'm so interested in in these plots that deviate Mm -hmm. from that, where, but that's a lot about that so I'll stop no that was great Um, if anyone (laughs) yeah if anyone has any novels that they'd like to recommend me specifically I would love that because (laughs) this is what consumes me lately (laughs) that I need more novels about unmarried women (laughs) okay awesome Margaret thanks for all your wisdom on intro to English studies it was really fantastic no this was really useful like I, I now want to like reimagine the class and that's the kind of benefit of these sorts of classes and also talking with you Paige is that these sorts of classes have infinite possibilities you can keep reimagining and coming back to it and making it yeah, better so let's sign off and go imagine some yeah. possibilities sounds great I'll talk Bye. to you later